First of all, Chag Sameach. Welcome to Israel, to Jerusalem, to Har Hazikaron, to Yad Vashem. I have prepared this in four different languages, so bear with me. Benvenu. Dabro Pachelavet. Benvenidos. We welcome the 215 educators from 34 different countries to the first international conference for educators in Jewish education. Day school principals, headmasters, and leading Jewish educators here at the International School for Holocaust Studies of Yad Vashem. We initiate this conference here to challenge you and to be challenged. We initiate this conference to listen to you and from you, your needs and your wants, and we will attempt to fill those needs and wants. We hope that these very intensive next three days will meet your expectations. I can say the name of the, all of my colleagues here in the school, that your presence here has exceeded our expectations, and we say to all of you, for making the great schlep from the four corners of the globe. I'd like to introduce Dorit Novak, the Director General of Yad Vashem. You all have a conference booklet. Please look inside your bags that you got. We gave you things to read. Dorit Novak became the Director General of Yad Vashem in 2013. After six years as the director of the Yad Vashem's International School for Holocaust Studies. Prior to that, she served as a program director of MILEV, the Wisconsin plan at the Ministry of Industry, Trade, and Labor, as well as the head of development and employment promotion, a combined program of the ministry and the joint distribution committee of JDC. Dorit Novak, please. Well, good, good evening. It's an honor, privilege, and a real excitement for me to open this conference that for me, in a way, is a dream come true. About 10 years ago, when I first stepped into this very school as the principal of the school, that was one of the theme and one of my dreams that one day, we will have a conference of Jew leading Jewish educators here in the school. And here it is. Thanks to Ephraim, Yal, Shulamit, Dorit, the rest of the team that make everything that this conference will really take place today, now, this week, this year. But before I will, uh, I want to start by sharing with you a personal story. You know, my family came from two different places in the world. My mother came from Morocco. My father came in the 30s from Poland. His grandfather, at the beginning of the 30s, out of, uh, out of Zionist uh, uh, initiative, took the family and came over. His three sisters came right after him and they build their life in Israel, one, one in the kibbutz, one becoming an intellectual professor for mathematics, the other one was a... Uh, and they made up the, their living here. I always heard that there is another brother that nobody spoke about, his name was Menachem. We knew the name, we didn't know anything about Menachem. Only when I came to Yad Hashem, I discovered that Menachem left Sanuk and went to Lvov in order to teach Hebrew to raise some money in order to come to Israel, as all the rest of the family did. But he didn't make it. But I discovered two more things. I discovered that Menachem was married. His wife's name was Tamar. First time I heard the name was here. 
and I discovered something even more strange for me. I, decide, I, I discovered that Menachem and Tamar had a daughter at the age of three. Her name was Yael. All three of them disappeared. I have three sons and one daughter. My daughter's name is Yael. When I called her Yael, I was sure that she is the first Yael in our family. Since I came to Yad Vashem, her name gained an additional meaning for me and for all the family. We discovered that she is not the first Yael. There was a Yael in our family. Yael that intended to come to Israel, never made it, but we are rebuilding our life here. And in a way, my daughter became a symbol of the memory of the, this three years Yael. And I can tell you that every single day, here at Yad Vashem, we find or we meet people that encounter with their past, that connects to their roots, to the memories their parents left for them here. And in many cases, the parents are not there anymore, but they left some tracks here. And when the time comes, people come and go through our, and search our uh, databases, and suddenly they find all kinds of new spots, information, data about their, their, their own family, their own roots. That's kind of, you know, obvious when we're talking about Jewish people that we all connect. We all connect, we have similar destiny, destiny and we have a definitely very similar past. But I can tell you that the fact that the Holocaust become such an important role in our life, and I can tell you not only in our life, we know from all the researchers in the last 10, 20 years, when you, you ask people, Jewish people all around the globe, what are the components of their identity, the Holocaust will appear there. <coughs> Unfortunately, as time goes by, we discover that the title Holocaust not always bury meaning and substance with it. It is our responsibility to fill the title with substance. Sometimes we think, why, 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 why is this so? Why they do keep saying that Holocaust is part of the identity, but when you continue asking, what is it there? In many cases, they know very few things. One of them, there are plenty of answers for that. One of them is the fact that survivors are disappearing slowly, slowly, and the young generation, in many cases, don't have first-hand encounter with Holocaust survivor. But more than that, for many, the Holocaust means death and destruction. What you're going to listen here and to hear here is that the Holocaust is not only that. The Holocaust teaches us many, many lessons and many, many, and has many, many meanings as it was one of the most extreme events in the modern world, it teaches us not only how low can humanity go, that's obvious, but also how high can the human spirit, spirit raise. You know, when people reach extreme situation, when they have to, to choose right or wrong, you know, choosing right when there is no price for right, this is obvious. But choosing right when there is an immense price for the right choice, that's something that we can learn from. You know, we educators, we have to be believers. We are all believers. We do work, we do plant in the hearts of our students norms, ethics, stories, history, and we hope that one day, if they will have to make choices, and probably we will not be there to assist them, when the choices will be hard to make, when there will be price for making the right choice, something that we said, something that we plant in their heart will be there to assist choosing the right act. This is not obvious. We do believe that what we're doing is leading that, that place. 
And I can tell you that for many years, people used to say that the role of the educators are going to be reduced as you know, the knowledge is the, the internet is the, the students are exposed to everything, everything, everything is accessible. What we've learned is the opposite. As the data and the knowledge is there, the role of educators become more and more crucial for society and for the entire human community. It is for us, I mean, we took it upon our shoulders. Nobody froze us. All the people sitting here are people that make up, make, made a choice to influence youngsters, to influence the next generation, to influence the community and the society by influencing, teaching, and really socializing the young generation in order to make a better society, a better community, a better world. You did it. And by coming here, you did another step. You said something that you're willing to become part, to us at least, you're willing to become part of a growing network of educators committed to Holocaust education, committed to keep the memory alive and meaningful and relevant. And maybe as our great teacher, Professor Gutmann said, the Holocaust refused to become a history. And this is our responsibility to translate these words into action. You know, there was an assumption once that modernity, enlightenment, um, edu higher education will bring with them higher moral level. The reality of the Holocaust and the reality afterwards taught us differently. We know that it is for us to take responsibility. Knowledge will not bring high level of, of values. Knowledge will not bring norms. It is for us to take the responsibility and to translate this extreme human experience into something relevant to youngsters today. And I can tell you that it is shared responsibility of educators all around the globe. And we see ourselves as kind of headquarter, as kind of the place, hub, where you can come, discuss, have dialogue, and see how it would be translated the best to your own community. How this message, how the message of the ability of the person to make the right choices, what does it mean human responsibility? This is what we can learn out of the Holocaust, not only how it can be take, taken to the worst and darkest places of human art, but also can teach us that human beings, as long as they live, they can make and they should make the right choices. And maybe that's a good place to finalize by two points. One of them is, uh, you know, one of the experiences I had the first year here in the school, I attended the Frying last session seminar of educators from around the globe. And everyone, you know, summarized his experience or her experience by saying it was a life-changing experience or by saying it was such a meaningful, professional or personal experience and so on. And there was one participant she said, before I tell you what it was for me, I want to, say, to, tell, to tell you something. My father, she said, is a Holocaust survivor. In the last few years, he's very much worried about what will happen when he won't be here anymore. Who will tell his story? Who will tell the story of the Holocaust? What will be remembered? And I can tell you, she, she, she looked at the Ephraim and Steffi, and she told them, I can tell you, before I'm going back home to see my own kids, I'm going back to my father. And I will hold his hands and I will tell you, Papa, your legacy is in good hands. And your good hands are joining now the good hands around the globe that take this responsibility and translate it into education, into action, into a meaningful experience for your students and for your community. And the last thing I want to say is quoting the, the, you know, the huge poem, Shaul Charnikhovsky. כי עוד אני מאמין באדם, גם ברוחו, רוח עז. Though I still believe in mankind, and in its spirit, strong and bold. Have a meaningful dialogue, have a meaningful conference, and happy Hanukkah.
We have another debate. Do we go in there? Join Genesis Philanthropy Group in 2016 as Vice President of Community Relations following five years serving as the Ambassador of the State of Israel in the Russian Federation and a long career as a broadcast journalist. Born in Vilnius, Lithuania, Bolander immigrated to Israel in 1967, where she learned Hebrew and the kibbutz before enrolling at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem to study English and sociology. During her studies, she began working as an announcer in the Russian division of the Voice of Israel. She continued her work in radio after earning her degree. I call here Yuri Gorinder to address the audience. She is going to speak in Russian, and I'm going to translate into English. And then you get the translation from English. История Холокоста в СССР намеренно замалчивалась советским режимом и оставалась практически неизвестной большинству советских граждан. Не буду останавливаться на причинах этого явления, одно из которых было нежелание советского руководства касаться активного участия местного населения в массовом уничтожении евреев на оккупированных нацистами территориях. Эта тема была слабо изучена, они не говорили на уроках истории в школах. До начала Горбачевской перестройки проводилось очень мало серьезных исследований на эту тему. И изредка тема Холокоста прорывалась э, читателям в основном в художественной литературе в период Хрущевской оттепели и сразу после этого, в 1961 году. Литературная газета опубликовала поэму Евгения Евтушенко «Бабий Яр». Это был прорыв 20-летнего молчания об этой трагедии. The history of the Holocaust in the USSR was intentionally silenced by the Soviet regime and remained largely unknown to the majority of Soviet citizens. I will not dwell here on the reasons for such censorship, one of which was the Soviet intent to avoid any discussion on the collaboration of local peoples and the mass killings of Jews in the occupied territories. The topic was poorly researched and absent in the school history lessons. Until Gorbachev's prehistorica and following the breakup of the USSR, no serious research was undertaken on the subject. The theme of the Holocaust reached the mass audience only sporadically, mostly in the literature written and published during brief periods of liberalization, such as on the Khrushchev. For example, in 1961, one of the most famous of such outbreaks occurred when a poem Babi Yar by Yevdegi Yevtushenko was published in one of the most prestigious newspapers of the country. Thus came to an end 20 years of silence about this tragedy. В 1964-65 годах вышли в свет романы о трагедии Холокоста Ицхака Мэрса «Нища длится мгновение», «На чем держится мир» в 1963-65 годах была опубликована автобиографическая книга «Я должна рассказать» Марии Рыльни Кайти, которую называли литовской Анной Франк. Книга была написана на основе дневника, который юная Маша Рольник вела сначала в Вильнюсском гетто, а затем в нацистских концлагерях. Писатели Илья Эренбург и Василий Гроссман во время войны, они были военными корреспондентами, составили черную книгу о зверствах фашистов на оккупированных территориях СССР. Во время войны фронтовики присылали им большие материалы, которые им удавалось и получать. Это были документы, найденные на освобожденных от оккупантов территориях. Они рассказывали в своих письмах, что увидели или услышали. Иренбург решил создать дневники, предсмертные письма, свидетельские показания, относящиеся к истреблению гитлеровцами евреев, и издать черную книгу. Вместе с писателем Василием Гроссманом они взяли за эту работу, несмотря на гигантский объем подготовленных материалов, которые составляли 27 томов, книга была подготовлена к печати и рекордно короткое время. Но в 1948 году набор книги был уничтожен, рукописи, все материалы, которые были собраны, сданы в архив Министерства госбезопасности СССР. 
Впервые черная книга на русском языке вышла в свет в Иерусалиме в 1980 году, когда ее авторов уже не было в живых. In 1964-65, Itzhak Miras published his novels about the Holocaust, A Drug Takes a Moment, and On What the World Stands. Around the same time, Maria Olopena, Rona Nikita, called by some Lithuanian and friend, published her autobiography, I Must Tell, based on the diary she wrote first in the Vilna Ghetto and then in Nazi camps. Two Soviet Jewish writers, Ilya Ehrenberg and Vasily Gosman, who served as war correspondents during World War II, compiled a black book dedicated to the horrors perpetrated by the Nazis in the occupied Soviet lands. During the war, Ilya Ehrenberg received many letters from the front in which soldiers told him what they witnessed or heard. Ehrenberg decided to collect all the diaries and letters written by prisoners before their deaths, witness testimonies about the destruction of the Jews by the Nazis, and to publish them in one book. Together with Grossman, he edited 27 volumes of research into the Black Book. But in 1948, the whole typeset of the book was destroyed, and the manuscript and all the materials confiscated and archived by the Soviet Ministry of State Security. You will see light again here in Jerusalem in 1980, many years after its authors were already deceased. В результате многолетнего замалчивания темы истории Холокоста на оккупированных территориях Советского Союза выросло несколько поколений советских евреев, которые ничего или совсем мало знали об этих трагических страницах своей истории. Исключения составляли только те, для кого трагедия Холокоста коснулась лично. Расскажу о себе. Как уже вы слышали, я родилась в Вильнюсе после войны. Моя мама, светлая память, чудом выжила в гетто, ее муж и сын погибли. 200 тысяч евреев были уничтожены в Литве. Все, кто выжил, выжили чудом. Моя мама никогда не рассказывала об этом. А, и начала рассказывать мне и брату о том, что она пережила и какие страдания выпали на ее долю гораздо позже. После войны она вернулась в Литву, вышла замуж за моего отца, создала новую семью. И вот сегодня мы зажигаем третью свечу в честь чуда Хануки. И я вспоминаю свою маму. Пользуясь случаем, хочу всех поздравить, всех присутствующих с праздником Ханука. As a result, and for generations following World War II, in the former Soviet Union or elsewhere, the catastrophe of the Holocaust that took place on the territory of the USSR remained largely unknown. Those whose families and destinies were personally affected by the tragedy were only exceptions to the rule. In that context, let me say a few words about myself. I was born in Vilno after the war. My mother, of blessed memory, had survived the ghetto by nothing short of a miracle, while her son and husband perished. 200,000 Lithuanian Jews were massacred, and all those who survived knew that they were incredibly lucky. After the war, my mother returned to Lithuania, married my father, and created a new family. She never forgot, and always told me about my brother and about her terrible experiences and the suffering she endured. Today, when we light the third candle in honor of the Hanukkah miracle, I will remember her. So let me use this opportunity to wish you all Hanukkah Sameach. Когда рухнул железный занавес, в процессе возрождения еврейской жизни русскоязычных евреев в СНГ, Израиле, Соединенных Штатах Америки и других странах, стало ясно, как мало известна им история Холокоста, благотворительный фонд «Генезис» вместе с Мемориальным институтом памяти жертв нацизма «Яд Вашем» разработали междисциплинарную программу исследований и образовательных проектов, посвященных Холокосту на территории СССР. В 2008 году Генезис спонсировал эту программу, в рамках которой русскоязычные евреи получили возможность изучить не только трагедию Холокоста и героизм еврейских борцов с нацистами, но и предшествовавшую им историю еврейских общин Восточной Европы, их богатое культурное и духовное наследие, накопленные в яд вашем знания и опыт, наличие здесь исследовательской и образовательной структуры, международный статус мемориала – сделали ли Яд Вашем естественным партнером фонда «Генезис». В рамках этой совместной инициативы была создана огромная база новых данных о Холокосте в СССР. 
в рамках соглашений с семью главными архивами России, Украины, Литвы, Белоруссии, Эстонии, Латвии и Казахстана, почти 2 миллиона документов военного периода стали доступны Ядваше. 170 тысяч новых имен внесены в список жертв Холокоста. In the process of rebuilding Jewish life and reclaiming the Jewish identity of the Russian-speaking Jews in the former Soviet Union, Israel, U.S., and many other new diasporas, it became apparent that a large black hole exists in the knowledge of the Holocaust. The Genesis Philanthropy Group, in partnership with Yad Vashem, has initiated and developed an interdisciplinary, multifaceted study, research, education program on the Holocaust in the territory of the USSR and Jewish participation in World War II, titled Two Narratives, One history. In 2008, Genesis Philanthropy initiated a program that focused on strengthening Jewish identity among Russian-speaking Jewish communities based on learning and understanding the lessons of the Holocaust and heroism. The impetus for the partnership came because the Genesis Philanthropy strongly believes that it is insufficient to learn only about the tragedy with its horrors of destruction and persecution. Instead, it is vital also to explore the rich Jewish life diverse Jewish communities and Jewish creativity that preceded the Holocaust. Yad Vashem stood out as a natural partner in this endeavor with its leading expertise, necessary infrastructure, and enormous international reach. Over the years, the focus of the program broadened, and due to the Genesis philanthropy support, Yad Vashem was able to collect, study, and disseminate a gigantic body of new data on the Holocaust period in the USSR. Cooperation agreements were signed with seven central and previously inaccessible archives in Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan. 1.9 million archival documents concerning mass shootings, Jewish Red Army soldiers, history of collaborators in occupied zones, accounts of Jewish prisoners of war, forced evacuations were accessed and approved, shared by the FSU archives, which were strictly closed for public during, and in some cases, even after the Soviet rule. Over 170,000 new names were found in entering the central online database of Shoah victims' names. Будучи послом государства Израиль в России, я участвовала в одной из совместных акций фонда Генезис и Яд Вашем. Это было 26 января 2015 года в Москве на вечере реквиями, посвященном 70-летию освобождения концлагеря Аушвиц, Освенцем. И Международному дню памяти жертв Холокоста была передана в дар Центральному музею второй Великой Отечественной войны фоксимильная копия уникального документа, оригинал которого хранится в Израильском национальном мемориале Яд Вашем в Иерусалиме. Это список Шиндлера. 800 мужчин, 300 женщин, 100 детей. 1200 евреев, обреченных на уничтожение в печах Освенцима, спасенных немецким промышленником Оскаром Шиндлером. Пожелтевшие от времени листки бумаги с именами и фамилиями, это не кадры из фильма, а исторический документ. Это одно из множества свидетельств катастрофы. 27 числа, весеннего месяца Ниссан по еврейскому календарю, мы отмечаем день катастрофы и героизма европейского еврейства. Мы вспоминаем в этот день не только тех, кто был уничтожен нацистской варварской машиной, но и тех, кто с ней сражался. В Советском Союзе роль евреев во Второй мировой войне, в Великой Отечественной войне, зачастую замалчивалась, а в антисемитских шутках, шутках евреев обвиняли в трусости, даже сегодня. Далеко не все знают, что в рядах Красной Армии сражалось 500 тысяч воинов-евреев. Более 200 тысяч из них погибли. Евреи воевали в рядах польской армии Крайновой и в армиях стран антигитлеровской коалиции Великобритании и Соединенных Штатов. Евреи сражались во французском подполье, в партизанских отрядах в Беларуси и Украине. As an ambassador to the, the state of Israel to Russia, I took part in one of the joint initiatives of the Genesis Philanthropy in Yad Vashem. On January 26, 2015, the ceremony in Moscow, in honor of the International Holocaust Memorial Day, the Russian Central Museum of the Great Patriotic War received a facsimile copy of the original historic document which is kept in Yad Vashem in Jerusalem. This document I note to you is Shindler's list. 800 men, 300 women, 100 children. Jews contend to burn the fires of Auschwitz, saved by the German industrialist Oskar Schindler. 
pages of simple paper, yellow by time, names and family names. This wasn't a prop from a movie, this was history. This was evidence, one of many. On the 27th day of the spring month, spring month Nisan, we mocked the Holocaust Heroism Memorial Day. On this day, we remember not only those who were devoured by the Nazi machinery of slaughter, but also those who fought it. The role of the Jews in bringing about the victory over Hitler was silenced and ignored by the Soviets. Instead, anti-Semitic jokes circulated about the Jews who spent the war comfortably in the rear. Even today, not everyone knows that 500,000 Jews fought in the ranks of the Red Army alone, and more than 200,000 died fighting. Jews fought in the Polish Home Army and the Allied Armies of the United States and Great Britain in the French Resistance, which they were first to establish, and in partisan groups in Belarus and Ukraine. И очень один важный факт дополнительно. 157 бойным евреям присвоено название Героя Советского Союза. 14 стали полными кавалерами Ордена советской, Солдатской Славы. По статистике, процент евреев, отличившихся на фронта Второй мировой войны, во много раз превышает процентный состав евреев в, населен... в населении этих стран. Евреи сражались не только за свой дом, своих родных и близких, но и за право жить в этом мире, право, в котором они от, им отказывали нацисты. Сегодня фонд Генезис стремится гарантировать, что их память и их героизм не будут забыты никогда. Фонд Генезис убежден, что эта уважаемая конференция внесет новый ценный вклад в достижение нашей общей цели – нести в будущее свет памяти о шести миллионах и о преступлении их убийц, сделать так, чтобы каждое новое поколение получало возможность открывать для себя эту ужасную, эту героическую страницу истории нашего народа. Мы горды партнерством с Яд Вашем и надеемся продолжать его далее на благо всего еврейского народа. Туда раба, хак самех. Of being named the hero of the Soviet Union. Fourteen became fully decorated with the Order of Glory. According to statistics, the share of Jews among all distinguished soldiers of the war is much higher than the share of the population of the warring countries. Jews fought not only for their homes and for their loved ones, but for the very right to live, which was denied to them by the Nazis. Today, Genesis Philanthropy Group strives to make sure their heroism and their memory are not forgotten. We at the Genesis Philanthropy Group are certain that this distinguished gathering will contribute even more to our mutual goal to carry forth the torch of the memory of the six million and the infamy of their murders and to make sure that each new generation gets an opportunity to discover for itself this terrible and heroic chapter in the history of our people. Genesis Philanthropy Group is proud to partner with Yad Vashem and hopes that this cooperation will continue for the benefit of all Jewish people. Thank, Thank you, you to David. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, David. We will now be lighting the Hanukkah candles for the third night of Hanukkah. We have with us this evening Rabbi Samir Lau, who will be doing in his honor. Before we begin the lighting, something about this special menorah that we will be using. This menorah, as well as the other menorot that we'll be lighting each night, all come from the Artifacts Department of Yad Vashem. Each one of these menorot have a story attached to them. I want to thank, personally, Michal Tal, Michal Tal and Iris Bal near Cohen for their help in finding these special menorot and their stories. This particular menorah, donated by the Association of Jews from Krakow, dates from the 18th or early 19th century. It is made in the image of a facade of a synagogue, reminiscent of facades of wooden shows they were common throughout the Thuradian Poland up to the Shoah. These shoes were burned and destroyed during World War II. As you can see, the menorah was also used to light candles, the Shabbat, in addition to the Hanukkah candles. I want to add that Rabbi Lau's mother's family, on, her mother's, on his mother's side, are all from Krakow. So this is the shield. Rabbi Lau. Rabbi Lau. In order to prepare this introduction to you, I decided to sit down this last Shabbat and read again 
her inspiring story out of the depths, literally from cover to cover. And I will come back to that cover to cover. In autumn 1942, only five years old, you experienced what no Jewish child should ever have to experience, a selection. Together with your mother and brother Shmuel, you were forced into the great synagogue. The Nazis called out your mother's name. She tried to hide you both by pressing both of her sons close to her and under the cover of darkness to exit the show. It was only partially successful. You and your mother succeeded, but Shmuel remained in the show. He was taken on the next day on a deportation train that sent him and your father to Jablinka. After this aktion, your mother, you and Naftali, remained to work in the ghetto in the glass factory until November 1944. Dogs, boots, trains were your most vivid, vivid memories from this period. And again, a train, 1944, November 1944. You boarded a train with your mother and other women and children while Naftali was on a different train. Your mother instinctively realized that you would have a better chance with your older brother Naftali and she threw you literally threw you in his direction. Your mother was sent to, was sent to Ravensburg, where she perished on December 26, 1944, and you and were sent to Buchenwald. That date you only learned many, many years later, the exact date of your mother's death. In Block 8 in Buchenwald, it was a Russian soldier Officer, Fedor, who helped you survive the cold and hunger. He took you under his wings. And on April 11, 1945, the Americans liberated Buchenwald. Here's a picture from that liberation on the left hand side. You're wearing the uniform of a Hitler Union and carrying a rifle. And the American soldiers asked you, what do you want to do? You answered, to take revenge. So the American soldier gave you this rifle and this small suitcase, which became your entire home for the next decade of your life. After your marriage in February 1960 to Chaya Ita, your wife expressed her desire to throw out this old born suitcase. You protested, that's my home. You explained to her that this suitcase will remain in your storage attic. You said, God willing, our children will lack for nothing. But if someday one of them should complain that he or she lacks for something, I will have that child climb the ladder to the attic, find the suitcase, and take it down. Then I will say, this was your father's home for many years and in many places. You must not complain, because I never did. My, my wife understood me. The picture of Naftali and Elizal Schiff is a very interesting picture here, where the bottom picture over here, it's one of the only pictures where you're not smiling. You're not smiling because you don't want to get off the boat. Someone had told you that the Arab ship workers there were kidnapping Jewish children, and therefore you didn't want to get off the boat. Where had they brought you? To a place where Jewish children are going to be kidnapped? And Azal picked you up, took you off the boat, and safely planted you on the ground of Eretz Yisrael. The three brothers, Yeshua, Naftali, Sermer. By the way, Fedor, who passed away many years ago, you managed to track him down, and his two daughters, in this picture over here, were given citations by Yad Vashem of what he had done in saving you. Yad Bukhunov, righteous among the nations. I'm going to end this long introduction with what I mentioned in reading your book from cover to cover, I found the most significant paragraph was the last paragraph of the book, which is why I read it from cover to cover. 
And I'm going to quote this. It connects with everything that we're doing in these next four days. My eldest son, Moshe Chaim, became a Baal Mitzvah on the Shabbat when we read the biblical account of the Israelites' battle with Amalek. I had not intended to make a speech on this occasion, but the planned speakers pressured me, including my uncle, Rabbi Fogelman, and my father-in-law, Rabbi Frankel. So I spoke about the last verse in the chapter of Exodus. The Lord maintains a war against Amalek from generation to generation. We cannot fight the enemy, Amalek, the nation or the phenomena, with weapons or with ammunition. Rather, we are obliged to fight this battle in every generation, each generation passing on our heritage to the next. The struggle for the community, the continuity of generations is the true battle. And the great spiritual divine victory of Israel against the adversary of Amalek. A victory in the war against Amalek is that my son, Moshe Chaim Lao, is continuing the heritage of his grandfather, my father, Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lao, who went up to heaven in a tempest. Moshe Chaim is the first candle in the private Hanukkah Minoah I have been privileged to create. My wife is the base of that Minoah, from which the candles, our eight children, went out into the world. I am the Gabai, whose role is to help light those candles so they will spread the light and proclaim, each in a special way, the miracle of the victory of eternal Israel. <laughs> that Hanukkah menorah has expanded tenfold. Rabbi Lau, we honor you with peace coming up and making the blessing. Please rise for the blessing. We will allow the breath for the candles. Keep our lives. Oh.
Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, I will do it a little bit shorter. I just want to tell you a story. From an experience, not from the Holocaust, from here, from Israel, 1971. 1971, I was privileged to conduct a Seder of Passover in a camp of the Air Force, the Israeli Air Force, somewhere in the south. There were 750 pilots and the soldiers in that camp who participated that Seder night. And in addition, we have 80 guests from America, from the United States, leaders of the Israeli bonds. They came as visitors to Israel, as tourists from Passover to the after Yom Ha'atzmaut. And they were invited to the Air Force camp to the Seder I have conducted, 80 people. I spoke a little bit in English to make them involved with the Seder. Every one of them received from the chief army rabbinate in Haggadah and Pesach. Hebrew and English it was very nice. At the end, I was sitting on the stage. All the 80 people came on a line to thank you, to pay some tribute, how nice it was, how happy they are. One of them, I'm sitting on the stage. One of them came with the Haggadah took out a pen from his pocket and said to me, Rabbi, write me your dedication on this Haggadah. Night of Passover. And coincidentally, 1971 was also the night of Shabbat. Not just Passover. Both. I didn't know what to do. And everyone is, looks at us we are shown by everybody, held by everybody. And I didn't want to embarrass him, to insult him. All of a sudden, someone saved me. I have heard a baritone tone of someone who was on the line, one of the leaders of the bonds. Jack, he said to the Jews, Jack. The rabbi doesn't fight on the holidays. I looked at the one who saved me. A priest, a Baptist priest, on his corner, you saw that he is a priest. The priest said to Jack that the rabbi doesn't fight on the holidays. I He was so embarrassed, so ashamed, he was blushing. I asked him, Jack, sit next to me. I want to know you a little bit closer. Where do you live? He told me the name of a city, a small city in California. I don't want to mention because I will tell you just his last name also. Small city. Uh, what is your name? Jack? He said, yeah. I carry the name of my grandfather from Warsaw, the capital city of Poland. My grandfather was Yankee Rubinstein. And I am Jack Robinson. It's not a joke. Jack Robinson. After my aunt, my grandfather, Yankee Rubinstein. You don't conduct the Seder night in your home when you are in California? He said, unfortunately not. 
I have almost nothing with Jewish heritage. My father came young boy, in a way, long way. I was brought up not in a Jewish environment, not in Jewish education, neither a Jewish school. We don't we don't have say that Pesach at home. High holidays, Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah. I know about it, but uh, I don't observe it. Not Pesach, not Rosh Hashanah, not Yom Kippur. I didn't ask about Sukkot or Shavuot. <laughs> didn't ask. So I said to him, "So there is nothing in connection with you. You have a family." I said, yeah, I have some children. Some of them married out already. And I know that some of my grandchildren are not Jewish anymore. Then he continued. But there is one thing that I insist on. One evening that all my children and grandchildren come to my home in this place from all over the United States. This evening is holy. They must be with the parents, me and my wife. This is the night of the first candle of Hanukkah. I said, how do you know when it is? The 25th of Kislev. The month's Kislev is not in the calendar. He said, you're right. But I have a friend in Los Angeles. He is on a way, an observant Jew. Every year after the high holidays, he gives me a phone call telling me, Jack, write this date in December. This is the night of the first candle of Hanukkah. Right there. This is the only I give a phone call to all my children from coast to coast. In this date of December, you must be in the home. I said to him, excuse me, asking you why? Not the night of Passover, not Yom Kippur not blowing the shofar of Rosh Hashanah, but the first candle of Hanukkah. Why? Exactly this evening. He said, for educators, it's a good message. He said, excuse me, Rabbi, I don't understand the question. What does it mean, why this first candle? Don't you know that Judah the Maccabee and myself are in the same front line. We both fight assimilation. That's my night. And my children who married out must know this is our concept of life. What do I want? I want for them nothing. But I want to promise the continuity and the immortality of the name of my grandfather. They must know that they are Jewish. Identity. This is the way of education of Jack Robinson in California. Through the first night of Hanukkah, a small candle, one candle, but this small candle is a part of a great heritage. And he was shocked that I asked him why. What means why? For him it's not by Yami Mahem, a miracle which happened 2,200 years ago. It's a story of today. It's up to date. The story of Hanukkah. Fighting assimilation. To prevent the, the disconnection of generations. He wants a continuity of young Robinson from Varsha in California. He's right. Right. I was very touched by him. And if I remember it so in the details. It happened on Pesach 1971, over 45 years ago. And I can never forget the lesson I have got from Jack Robinson. 
It's a great list. More than many books. Me and Shuta de Maccabi are on the same front line. We fight together assimilation. This is Hanukkah. To you educators who came to this conference in Yad Vashem, I don't have to tell you, Hanukkah is from the root of Chinuch. The word Hanukkah, beginning, beginning the temple, beginning the altar, Hanukkah and Chinuch, which means education, come from the same root in Hebrew. The festival of Chinuch is Hanukkah. That's why you are gathered here in Hanukkah, especially in Yad Vashem. Because this is the Yontif of Chinuch, the festival of a Jewish education, Jewish identity. Exactly the name of this conference belongs to these days of Hanukkah. And pay attention, you can tell it to your students all over the world, where you come from and you go back. Tell them, if one of them knows who is the great, great grandson of King Antiochus, the king of Greece, who ruled over the whole world at that time, including Judea, Who is his descendant? One of them, mention the name, disappeared. No continuity. But great grandchildren of Matityahu, that is son Judah the Maccabee, we have them in every shul. When the Kohanim come on the stage, to give their blessings, Yivarechecha Hashem Yishmerech, they are the descendants of Aaron Kohen, brother of Moshe, Moshe Rabbein. 3,400 years, you can point out and say, he is a Kohen. What is a Kohen? Father, and grandfather, and great-grandfather, Kohanim, descendant of Aaron Kohen, because of this small kettle. They, they were not destroyed. There was never Cyclone B, never gas chambers against the old classic Greece or Rome. And you don't have a descendant of Julius Caesar. You don't have a descendant, a grandson of Hannibal who defeated Rome. They disappeared. Why? That is assimilated. And the only nation of that time, the Jewish people, they lived the Kenya in the same day of the 25th of Kislev, and they carry the name, and they know who is a Kohen, who is not. <coughs> it's an unbroken chain because of the tradition of the Jewish heritage told by Jewish educators like you. You have the key for our immortality. You hold the key for the eternity of the Jewish people. So if there is a slogan, Am Israel Chai, Am Israel Chai, in your hands, in your hands, educators, we came here not only to speak about Shoah, but to speak about future. And to promise that future depends on you. Hug Sameach. Thank you, Rabbi Lau. He has to get back to Tel Aviv. Thank you for being with us. I'd like to invite, keep alive, Rafi, Nathan, David, Rafi, Abishai, Moshe, Mer, and the
every Jewish Chag, every Jewish holiday, there's a very, very similar story of an enemy that comes to either destroy us mentally or our religion or us physically. Um, our next song is a Pesach song, Reish Shalanda, but it's very, very appropriate now. Um, this time we, we mix it up with When You Believe, originally sung by Mariah Carey, I think, right? Reish Shalanda, When You Believe. Michael Jackson also did it. Shanti pa nalik et ha-teora, ti pa nalik et ha-teora. Say hi, Nathan. 
Thank you for that. Okay, this next part, you're all going to be singing in a minute. Ready? Ready. I don't think you're ready. Ready? Ready. Okay. Oh, shalom aleinu. Oh, shalom aleinu. Oh, shalom aleinu. Ve'akulam. Now you. Don't say you want to do anything, girl. Hands down, Amy. Perfect. That sounds pretty good. This side. Okay, now you can sing, lady. Here we go. This is Mayor Fox from um, Teaneck, New Jersey. Say hi, Mayor. Okay, so next part is the harmony. Ojabo shalom aleinu. Ojabo shalom aleinu. Ojabo shalom aleinu. Ve'akula. Let's hear it. Ojabo shalom aleinu. Okay, that's a bit more difficult. Um, five rows at the back, we can't see you because of the lights, but we know you're there. Okay, this is David. Say hi, David. Hi, David. Hi, David. Hi, David. Okay, so the third part, if the first part was Third part, you hold the top. Salam, Aleinu me'al kola. Salam, salam. Let's hear it. Salam. Salam, salam. Okay, three parts so far. <laughs> These empty rows and you guys, okay? First four rows. This is Rafi Nathan. Say hi, Rafi. Hi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys can also say hi, Rafi. Hi, Rafi. Hi, Rafi. Hi, Rafi. Hi, Rafi. He's our beatboxer. He's going to teach you a little Okay, so all the guys on the first row, are you with me? <laughs> Don't scream too loud, okay. So, very simple. All I gotta do is the following. <laughs> no, seriously, it's not good, but don't spit too much. So, here we go, here we go. I got glasses, that's why I wear glasses. Okay.
Thank you so much for your cooperation. Maybe we'll try something a bit more difficult um, in the near future. Um, the three founders of the group are originally South Africans. Any South Africans here? One, two. Never mind, you won't sing this next song, then. Yeah? How's um, it Okay. So we made this African medley with a bit of Israeli touches. It's still one of our favorite songs to perform. We hope you like it. Two guys in Medalia, two guys in Medalia by themselves, 
Good news. I wish I was. We have two guys that made it yeah, with their families when they were very young. And we have two guys, myself and Nathan here, that made Aliyah, that their families made Aliyah, but we were born in Israel. So this next song really, really tells the story of Keep Alive and their connection to Israel. Any, any of you seen uh, this song, We Are Home on YouTube, maybe? No? Nobody? Yeah, I heard birds, right? To meet it after the show on the bus, no, that YouTube, we are hoping this is our most successful song so far. Um, it's to the tune of um, 500, 500 miles by Eddie West. Um, we like the tune, we changed the lyrics, we hope you like it. Thank you. 